Slavoj Žižek, The Sublime Object of Ideology, The End of Ideology? Imagine yourself back in 1989. The Berlin Wall is being smashed to pieces by eager Germans, and with it, the grand ideological battle of the 20th century seems to be ending. Capitalism has triumphed. Some even declare it's the end of history. But is ideology ever really dead? Enter Slavoj Žižek, a philosopher who dares to challenge this view. He argues that ideology isn't gone, it's just hiding in plain sight, woven into the very fabric of our daily lives. To understand Žižek's radical perspective, you need to step into the world of post-structuralism. For thousands of years, philosophers from Aristotle to Wittgenstein had been occupied with finding fixed meaning in language. They believed that only through careful definition could humans really describe reality. But the philosophies which emerged in the late 20th century treat language as a vast, ever-shifting network where meaning is never fixed. When you apply that to your understanding of reality, things that once felt solid start to seem a bit wobbly. Enter French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. He proposed a revolutionary way of understanding the unconscious. Instead of seeing it as Freud did, a murky pool of repressed instincts, Lacan suggested it functions much like a language. This doesn't mean the unconscious uses words as we do, but rather that it operates using similar principles of meaning-making. Think of your unconscious as a vast network of symbols and associations. Just as words gain meaning through their relationships to other words, your unconscious thoughts and desires are shaped by complex connections to other ideas and experiences. These connections often operate below the surface of your awareness, influencing your thoughts, feelings and actions in subtle ways. For example, you might find yourself inexplicably drawn to certain patterns or repeating certain behaviours without knowing why. Lacan would suggest these are like phrases in the language of your unconscious, expressing deeper desires or conflicts that you're not consciously aware of. This approach opened up new ways of interpreting human behaviour and culture. It suggests that our innermost thoughts and desires, while deeply personal, are also shaped by the symbolic systems we inhabit, from language itself to the broader cultural narratives we live within. Zizek takes these heady ideas and applies them to everything from politics to pop culture. He's like a magician, revealing the hidden ideological structures in places you'd least expect. That romantic comedy you love. It's reinforcing certain ideas about love and society. Your desire for the latest gadget, it's part of a larger system of meaning tied to capitalism and consumerism. But what exactly is ideology in this post-Cold War world? Imagine it as an invisible pair of glasses you're wearing right now. These glasses colour everything you see, influencing your thoughts and actions in subtle ways. It's not just what you think, it's the very framework that shapes how you think. The Sublime Object even if you've never read the original book or seen one of the countless film adaptations of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, you likely know every twist and turn of the plot. The storyline of poor but plucky Elizabeth and handsome rich Mr. Darcy, who clash on first meeting but finally fall in love, has captivated audiences for centuries and spawned countless imitations. Why? Zizek would argue it's not just the story, but the underlying ideological structure that keeps us hooked. In Austin's world, love and social status dance a complicated waltz. At first glance, the novel is a simple romance. But look closer, and you'll see an intricate depiction of social norms, class expectations, and desires that shape the character's actions. This, Zizek argues, is ideology at work. Ideology isn't just a set of beliefs you consciously hold. It's the invisible framework that shapes how you perceive and interact with the world. It's like the grammar of society. You use it every day without thinking about it. Austen's genius was drawing it in vivid detail in her novels. But ideology is at work in your daily life too. Consider how you choose your clothes each morning. You might think it's a purely personal choice, but your decisions are influenced by unspoken rules about what's appropriate, fashionable or expressive of your identity. That's ideology in action. And ideology isn't just restrictive. It's also the source of pleasure, or as Lacan calls it in French, jouissance. 
Think about the joy you get from finding the perfect outfit. It's not just about the clothes, it's about either fitting into or boldly defying society's expectations. This brings us to the concept of the object petita, or the elusive object of desire that keeps us engaged in ideological structures. In Pride and Prejudice, object petita is the social ideal of a perfect match that drives the plot and the central characters. In your life, it could be the pursuit of the perfect job, relationship, car. Even a reusable cup or detangling hairbrush can become an object of desire in late capitalism. Having the trendiest item holds the promise of fulfillment, but never delivers. That's because the key to this object of desire is that it is never fully attainable. Like a mirage, it keeps shifting as you approach it. You might think that landing that promotion, getting the latest gadget, or buying a bigger house will bring you happiness. But once you have it, there's always something else to crave. This constant pursuit finally leads us to the idea of the sublime object of ideology. It's the kernel around which our desires and social structures orbit, and it's what gives our ideological systems their power and persistence. It's not something you can hold or even fully understand, but it drives the choices you make. It's the elusive promise that if you just reach a little further, you'll finally find fulfillment. And that's what keeps the system running. Whether it's in Austin's novels or our everyday lives, this sublime object pulls us in, keeping us hooked on the hope of a perfect outcome, even though it's always just out of reach. Reality and the Three Orders If our unconscious desire is driving so many of our decisions and beliefs, it's worth examining how we understand the nature of reality itself. Lacan proposed that our experience of reality is structured by three orders, the real, the imaginary, and the symbolic. Zizek explores these concepts in depth and applies them to both the individual and to culture itself. Think of these orders like the three legs of a stool. With all three in place, the seat is stable. But if one of the legs is missing, the whole thing falls down. The symbolic order of reality is like the rules of the game. It's the shared languages and symbols of culture, as well as the social norms that allow you to navigate the world. When you exchange money for goods, you're operating in the symbolic realm. Likewise, when you read words on a page, the shapes and sounds are part of a symbolic order. Language. That communicates ideas. Next, the imaginary order is like the funhouse mirror of your psyche. It's not just about the idealized version of yourself you present on social media, but encompasses all the ways you construct and perceive identity, both your own and that of others. Lacan traces this back to Freud's mirror stage of infancy, where you first recognize your reflection and form a cohesive self-image. The imaginary is the realm where you craft narratives about who you are and how the world works. It's the filter through which you interpret your experiences, often filling in gaps with assumptions and fantasies. In culture, the imaginary is everywhere. It's in the photoshopped magazine covers that shape beauty standards, the carefully curated Instagram feeds that define life goals, and the political sound bites that paint simplified pictures of complex issues. Zizek points out how movies and TV shows often function in the imaginary, providing us with idealized scenarios that shape our expectations of real life. Finally, there's the real order. It's the raw, unfiltered experience that resists symbolization. The real is what exists beyond language and imagination, the part of existence that can't be captured by words or images. It's often associated with moments of immense trauma or intense experience that shatter our understanding of the world. In many ways, both the imaginary and symbolic orders exist to help humans deal with the real. Trauma, illness, death, natural disasters, those moments when individuals or whole civilizations face realities that they can't handle. That's the real. But it is also there when you witness a clear, starry sky and are suddenly overcome by the vastness of the universe. In other words, the sublime. By acknowledging the real, you recognize that there's always something that escapes our understanding, a fundamental gap in our experience of reality that can never be fully closed. The symptom. The gaps in reality left by the three orders have to be filled in, both by individuals and whole cultures. 
To understand how this works, imagine you're a detective trying to solve the mystery of your own mind. You've noticed some quirks in your behavior. Maybe you always take the long way home, or you can't resist buying books you never read. These aren't just random habits, they're clues. In Zizek's philosophy, these peculiarities are called symptoms. A symptom isn't a sign of disorder, it's a compromise between your conscious desires and unconscious conflicts. It's like a pressure valve for your psyche, releasing tension in unexpected ways. Like beer for Homer Simpson, a symptom is both the problem and the solution, or the way you've found to cope with the contradictions in your life. But there's also a displacement of time at work in all this. Think about Marty McFly in the film Back to the Future, where his actions in the past create the very future he came from. Similarly, Zizek argues that the meaning of your actions is often determined retroactively. In other words, your symptoms aren't just effects of past causes, they actively shape how you interpret that past. But here's where it gets really interesting. Symptoms aren't just personal either. They exist on a societal level. A society's symptoms are the points where its ideological contradictions become visible. For instance, a culture might preach environmental responsibility while simultaneously celebrating consumerism. Or it might preach hard work to get ahead while taxing lower incomes disproportionately. These contradictions create cognitive dissonance, and that's the societal symptom coming to the surface. This brings us to the concept of ideological jouissance, the paradoxical enjoyment we derive from our beliefs even when they clash with reality. It's like watching a tragedy unfold on screen and feeling a mix of pain and pleasure. You might feel guilty about your carbon footprint, but still get a thrill from buying a new gadget. That's ideological jouissance at work. Understanding symptoms and ideological jouissance helps us see patterns of meaning in the world around us. But how do all these threads come together to form a coherent picture? That's where we need to explore the concept of ideological quilting, the way certain key ideas act as anchors, holding our belief systems in place. The stitches that quilt meaning. While it might seem a strange metaphor for how people and societies actively craft meaning, imagine for a moment the process of making a quilt. Each layer, the patchwork top, the padding in between, and the simple bottom can all shift and slide around when they're separate. It's the stitches that bind them together into a unified whole. This is how Zizek envisions the way meaning forms in our cultures and ideologies, with each part coming together through shared connections. In the fabric of society, certain ideas act as anchor points, much like the stitches holding the quilt layers together. Lacan called these points de capitons, or quilting points. They're the key concepts that give stability to our worldviews. It's similar to how the idea of freedom functions in American culture. It's not just a concept, but a quilting point that ties together diverse notions of personal rights, economic systems, and national identity. It's the thread that stitches the American dream into a recognizable pattern. But here's the twist. These quilting points aren't fixed or universal. They're more like temporary knots, always at risk of coming undone. What seems like an unshakable truth in one era might unravel in the next. Remember when the sun revolved around the earth? That was once a quilting point of human understanding. This quilting process isn't just about ideas, it's intimately tied to desire and pleasure. Each stitch in the ideological quilt promises to fulfill a desire, to make sense of the world in a satisfying way. It's like the rush you get when you think you've figured it all out. That's the pleasure of ideology at work. But just as finishing one section of a quilt only reveals more fabric yet to be stitched, satisfying one desire only leads to new ones. It's an endless cycle, with each quilting point creating new spaces to be filled. Understanding this quilting process gives you a new perspective on how societies form and maintain their belief systems. It invites you to examine the quilting points in your own worldview. What are the key ideas that hold your beliefs together? How might they be stitched together differently? By recognizing the nature of ideological quilting, you gain the ability to unpick some of those stitches, to re-examine the patches of your worldview, and perhaps to quilt them together in new, more conscious ways. It's an invitation to become the master stitcher of your own understanding.